Our speaker today is Abigail Hanabich, and she'll be speaking on home birth, elective cesarean, and undisturbed birth. She's going to give a personal account about her experiences. Abigail's passion for helping women to become empowered stems from her mother's own experience while delivering her. The process was completely medicalized to the detriment of both of them. Therefore, when she discovered that she was pregnant in her early 20s, she decided to have things as natural as possible. This led to a voyage of self-discovery and learning what would help her through pregnancy and childbirth. She feels her calling lies in supporting women to make informed choices about their pregnancy and birth and sees herself as a birth worker. She's a mother to six children aged between two and a half years and 12 years. She's able to handle family life as well as create time for pregnant women and share to share their hopes and fears about pregnancy and birth. If you want support, she offers a one-to-one -one service for this. She has breastfed for 12 years continuously throughout pregnancy. Currently, she's training to become a Lelesh League leader, which is a breastfeeding counselor. She feels her experience would hold her in good stead for this position to assist mothers who may want to try and breastfeed their children. Her birth experiences have been diverse, from hypnobathing to elective cesarean and home baths. One thing that she experienced during one of her home baths that stands out for her is the fetal ejection reflex. She learned when birth is not interrupted and when it's not hindered, it is a much quicker experience, less painful and straightforward. This is what inspired her to explore the subject she's going to be talking about. She hopes to share her experiences with women to help them see for themselves how birth can be different. We now welcome Abigail Beach to take us through her presentation. Oh, thank you so much, Catherine. Hello, everybody. So I'm, I'm really pleased, so privileged to be here. Um, I'm really glad that I've been given this opportunity to talk about pregnancy and birth, a subject which is really, really close to my heart. Um, so today I'll begin by talking about my journey that led me to decide that hmm, maybe I'm going to do things a bit differently. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the muscles of the womb and how they all work together to help the baby to be born. And I'll be sharing with you my experiences of home birth, cesarean and undisturbed birth. So. I first fell pregnant when I was about 22 years old and I thought, oh gosh, I'm pretty young to be having a baby. And, you know, I was, I was kind of frightened about the birth process and worried about the whole thing really. So I went to see my mother-in-law and she said, oh, hey, don't worry. It's just like shelling peas. And, you know, the seed was kind of planted by her really because she um, recommended this book, Childbirth Without Fear. And uh, her mother had given that to her um, and she'd prepared herself mentally by reading this book with her first baby. And then she went on to have three babies born at home and one in the hospital. And it, she didn't seem like the sort of woman who would have a baby at home. Um, she was kind of stern, you know, and a kind of a strict woman. And uh, so when she talked about her home births and how wonderful they sounded, I thought, gosh, well, maybe that might be something for me because, you know, it's really nice to stay at home. It's it's your own environment where you can relax most of all. And so I, I just felt like, okay, maybe, maybe home birth would be for me. So anyway, I devoured this book and I kind of read everything that felt relevant to me, which was pretty much nearly the whole thing. Um, you know, it described Grantly Dick Reed, the obstetrician. He, he described like what happens to the the pregnant body, um, what happens during the birth process. And slowly but surely, I started to feel less nervous about the whole thing um, and started kind of embracing pregnancy um, and not seeing it as being this big sort of frightening thing. <clears throat> so um, one part of the book is um, he talks about when he went out into the community to support a lady who was in labor giving birth 
um, they call her the Whitechapel woman. Um, and basically, he just sat there like back in the shadows watching her and, you know, she lived in a really simple home. She kind of had rags for curtains, a bucket in the corner and just, you know, everything was pretty simple. Um, and she just gave birth just quietly in the corner. He offered her some chloroform at some point, but she decided, you know, she just sort of put her hand away, like pushed it away. And um, afterwards he said to her, well, why is it that you didn't cry out or why why is it that you didn't want any pain relief and she said well it's not supposed to hurt as a doctor so you know that was interesting for him and i suppose that helped him with his studies and care of women in the future but it, it really inspired me because it made me feel like oh this lady just saw home birth or just saw childbirth as being a natural part of life and i thought well that's kind of how i want to see it so so I prepared my mind for this book and I, you know, I looked on the internet to find out different things that were going to help me. And then I started preparing physically. So I, I went to Pilates classes um, and there's me in the garden with my dog um, practicing. <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and it was there that I met a nurse who, who said to me, because I, I said, oh, have you, any of you read Childbirth Without Fear? It's a brilliant book. And she immediately like put her hand up and was like, I, I read that and I had a pain-free birth. And um, I thought, wow, because in, in the book, he actually talks about the fear, tension, pain cycle um, and how like when you're sort of feeling fearful, you're like tensing up and anticipating what, you know, is going to happen. And then you're feeling like tense, and then in turn, this creates pain. So I'm, I'm thinking, well, you know, maybe if you can relieve some of that fear I mean fear is a real natural part of childbirth anyway it's good to have a certain amount of it but if you know you don't want to have so much that you're feeling so tense that you're you know tensing all of the muscles of your womb and because that's not going to be very helpful so she said about this book and how she'd had a pain-free childbirth experience and I thought well I want to know her and know everything that she has got to tell me about this so that I can try and aim for that so that sounds pretty good. Um, so she suggested to me going to hypnobirthing classes because that's what she did. And I didn't really like the sound of being hypnotized, but I, I rang up the teacher and she said, you know, it's not anything like that. It's deep relaxation, visualization techniques, um, and some other things in between. So I went along to the classes and uh, it was there that I learned about the individual sets of the womb. So this really helped me because, you know, you, you, you know, your womb is there. You know that there's a baby inside because you're getting bigger, but you can't really see like all of the muscles of the womb. And so this really helped me to kind of unlock the mystery and to realize that, well, there's all this, these muscles doing different things. So in, in the top picture, you've got the outer longitudinal muscle fibers. So they pull up comfortably and then they shorten and flex, like pulling up these inner circular muscles at the bottom, you know, well, they're kind of all over, but, you know, bringing them up, drawing them up and back. Um, and then that's what helps to open the muscles of the cervix. Um, and it's a very slow process. And then you've got the muscles in the middle that are like woven over the whole of the womb. And so you've got the, the, all of these different muscles working together. Um, and it's, it's just amazing because they're all doing these different jobs, working together for the same cause. And basically um, when, you know, when they're all working together, it's, it's bound to feel strong. This is just a diagram I did of them all together. So they're all working for the same cause. Um, so, and, and, and it's not every day that a woman gives birth. So I just had it in mind. Well, if all of these muscles are working together and they're gonna be doing this really hard job, it's bound to feel pretty strong, you know? Um, and from what I'd heard about it being the worst pain ever, well, maybe it's not necessarily the worst pain ever. Maybe actually it's just that there's so much going on there that it's it's feeling so, so powerful. Um, and it probably could feel overwhelming if you didn't really, you know, understand what was happening. So I just took it, like, took it in my mind to try and like work out what's going on. Um, so they're all, all the muscles are like pulling and working together and then they, they are tightening all, and making 
at the top of the womb that is the fundus and the, they're all kind of working together to bring up all of the muscles so that the baby can come out through the cervix and then when the muscles are at the top it gets quite thick and then if the mother is undisturbed um, there's something that happens called the fetal ejection reflex which is where they, they basically the baby is then like propelled out um, of the womb at the right point so during the hypnobirthing, I practiced the deep relaxation. Um, I learned how to relax my body from, from the count of five down to one. So, you know, five, head to your shoulders, four, shoulders to your arms, three, arms to your hips, two, hips to your knees, one, knees to your feet. So, and then after practicing that for a while, I could like relax my whole body. Um, and then just, you know, relaxing and letting my womb do the work. Um, and then as you can see from this diagram here, you've got the uter uterus before the surge and then during the surge, it's actually lifting up with all of the effort because of all of these wonderful muscles doing their job. So why not just take a day off and relax and let your womb birth your baby? Um, in this diagram, it shows the woman in the reclined position. She doesn't actually have to be in that position, but for this diagram, it kind of shows, shows what's happening pretty well. She should really be in whatever position she feels is instinctively comfortable. Um, so with all of these different things under my belt, I kind of felt absolutely prepared. Um, there was one thing during the hypnobirthing, which was a visualization technique. And so when you would start this uterine surge or contraction, you would be breathing a very long breath up into a big red balloon. And then as you breathe out, you would let the red balloon drift off across the landscape of your mind. And that particular visualization technique really helped me um, to have something to focus on. So yeah, so my, my first pregnancy that everything went really smoothly. Um, and then, you know, slowly went into labor and uh, the midwife came in the middle of the night. I've been in labor for about 12 hours been in my rocking chair listening to the CDs that the hypnobirthing lady had given me and and then the midwife arrived and she just sort of sat there and didn't really do anything she just palpated me and then just minded her own business which was felt good um but it wasn't until like the early hours of the morning that she, she was like had a decision that maybe things weren't progressing as she would like and then sent me out into the cold garden got me walking up the stairs and just kind of took me right out of my comfort zone and I, I didn't really like that but you know I felt like behind me what she was doing she'd been a midwife for lots of years so you know well things did progress quite quickly and then the baby was born and then as soon as the baby was born she cut the cord and stuck me in the leg with the Sintametrin injection and then I just sort of decided right okay I'm going to the bathroom have a shower and uh, then when I came back down, the baby was completely dressed and, um, you know, I, I hadn't seen that happen. So we kind of missed out on this space in time, which was only probably 45 minutes. But um, I think it had um, a knock on effect. And I, you know, I hadn't, <coughs> excuse me, I hadn't really researched that, that stage of labor. And so when she said to me, we'll give you that in case you have a hemorrhage, I just thought, well, God, I don't want to have that. So yeah, I was grateful. Um, but I later found out that this intermetrin injection is like a, like a fake hormone, so or a synthetic hormone, and it, it blocks the the love the love hormone that is flowing between the mother and the baby, um, like immediately after birth. So that you know that hormone is really quite important for the mother and baby to feel because it, it's really going to be beneficial for them when they're like beginning their breastfeeding journey, for example. Um, so. I decided, well, the next time, if I fall pregnant again, I probably wouldn't be so hasty to give that. Um, so with my second pregnancy, everything was was quite fine and running running smoothly. And, you know, I was just eating healthily, doing the things that I'd practiced before. Um, and then it got to 37 weeks and then the midwife said, oh, well, you have a, a breech baby. So I, I asked her what that entailed. And she said, well, it means your home births out the window and you'll be in the hospital with your legs up in stirrups and basically a pretty managed delivery of my baby and I thought well 
I smiled sweetly at her and then I kind of went home and I thought, well, this can't happen. I, you know, I, I, the thought of it just seemed awful. And I thought there must be another way. Surely it hasn't always been like this. But I learned that a lot of breech birth skills have been lost over the years. And, and actually cesarean birth is quite common for, you know, breech birth. And, and that's what they wanted for me. They wanted for me to look in at 37 weeks for a cesarean, but I declined and I preferred to wait. Um, <clears throat> so I waited till about 42 and a half weeks and, um, and it was a very long story, which I'm happy to talk to anybody about if you would like to email me, but um, cutting a long story very short, um, I decided at 42 plus five days to have an elective cesarean. Um, and I just kind of had to get my head around it. But in, in, in a way of helping myself, I made a birth plan. So I, I wrote on there that I wanted skin to skin. Um, I wanted to practice a lotus birth, which is where the baby is left connected to the umbilical cord and the placenta. And then to make it more of a gentle transition was my reasoning behind it. Um, and my husband thought I was mad, but I just, you know, I, I prepared, prepared myself and I took in some articles so that they could see what it was all about if they didn't know. And I took in a washing up bowl with a colander and the herbs and salt that were needed to sort of help um, this placenta afterwards. Um, and it does sound a bit crazy, but it, you know, for me at that time, it felt like I needed to have these certain things in place to help me feel comfortable about having this major surgery. Um, so, so that, you know, the baby was born really well and they gave it to me and we had immediate skin to skin. And then the, the midwives, one had the colander with the bowl underneath and put the placenta in there. So it was all a very interesting experience. Um, and then up on the ward, we co-slept, which is what I wanted. Um, and it was, you know, I, I felt pleased after the birth. I felt really, really happy that I'd, I sort of had all of my wishes respected. Um, and the midwives were fantastic and they were just really supportive, even though they didn't, some of them didn't understand and some of them were just like, throw that thing out. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, was a, it was a really great experience and I think it helped in the long run. Um, so then with my third baby, they, they really would, wanted me to go to the hospital because I, you know, it, it, there would have been a scar on my uterus and they, they were like, well, you know, there's risks associated with that. So I thought, OK, well, if there's risks, I better read up about them and, and get myself informed. So I read up about them, got myself informed and decided, well, I still really would like to have a home birth. Um, so I negotiated this with the midwives and put it all in place. So on the on the day that, you know, I went into labour, it was quite a jovial occasion. I had a, a friend there who who acted as my doula, my first person. Um, I had her there and then I had my four year old and two year old daughters. And then, you know, my husband was there in case they needed to go. Um, and then the, the midwife arrived and she had a student midwife. So it was all lovely. And there were, we had balloons up and it was just a celebratory occasion, which is, you know, how I wanted it to be a normal part of life. I wanted my children to see that and experience that, um, even though they don't remember now. I think somewhere deep in their being, they probably will. So, um, you know, the, the, everything ran yeah, and as a way of preparing my children as well, I should note that throughout my pregnancy, I came across these home birth books that were, um, you know, at children and um, families preparing for this. Uh, I had pictures of, and a storyline was like, the mother's going to be like a cat that, or roaring like a cat. So I thought, well, I'd better do that. <laughs> so, was, you know, in the throes of labour, mooing like a cow, roaring like a and I really do think that that actually helped like open everything up and just for everything to be much smoother and for me to have something to focus on and not like screaming out just but doing these like animal primal noises. Um, and so, you know, that, that was a really, really wonderful experience to have. And then after the birth, the, the um, student midwife said, wow, it was so lovely to see a woman just giving birth without any medical intervention because she actually hadn't seen that but that she'd only seen births in hospitals so this was like her first home birth that she'd been to so a couple of years after that 
I tend to space my children out every couple of years, but um, that's just the way it is for me. Um, so it, a couple of years after that, I fell pregnant with my son and um, he, he was born actually a couple of weeks early and or earlier than my other children. They were normally born around 40 to 41, except for my second. But um, I rang the midwife when I was in labor and she said, no, 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 you're not in labor. You've got weeks and weeks to go yet. Just carry on with your normal life. So I kind of, you know, went shopping. It, it just had so happened that the house was hit by this illness. So all my children had this illness and my husband had this illness. And, you know, we went shopping and uh, I ended up having strong contractions. So he had to do the shopping in his you know, ill state and wasn't very pleased. So what ensued was uh, we had a bit of an argument in the car on the way home. And I was like, that's it. I've had it now. We're going to get a divorce. And then we got home and, you know, he was having to do all of these, um, doing all of the, you know, putting the shopping away. Sorry, I don't know what happened there. He was having to put all of the shopping away and carpet clean and get everything ready because the midwife would be coming. Um, and I was just in the bath. I was like, right, I'm in the bath. And then my three three children were there. One of them was helping me put water on my tummy when I had a contraction. The next one giving me raisins. The next one giving me water. So it was, you know, a kind of normal part of life. And, you know, everything was going on. Um, and, you know, I, I decided through understanding my husband was really in a bad mood. Well, I'm just going to get on with giving birth and you be in your bad mood. So I was like getting on with it. And I, after a while, I rang the midwife and she she came round and all the children went to bed. So it was just me and the midwife. She wanted to do a vaginal examination kind of nearly immediately. Um, and my, my, as soon as she came in, like my first kind of question is when I meet the midwife, because, you know, sometimes you meet the midwife and you haven't ever met her before. So it's kind of like having a stranger come into your house, even though she's coming in to be like your support person and to help you. It still is somebody you've never met before. So I'm kind of like trying to suss out what she's like and and so my one of my first important questions for me is have you ever given birth before because I need to for me I need to know that she's experienced what I'm experiencing um and she hadn't she had dogs but anyway so she wanted to do this vaginal examination and I I was like well can we wait a little while and she said well the baby's not engaged so yeah we'll wait an hour so in that that moment I was like right I'm gonna go to the toilet and I went to the toilet and I kind of locked the door because I just wanted to have my sort of sacred space just with me and my baby and then within a couple of minutes I had a strong contraction and another one and it just felt like things like were moving and he I felt like he'd moved right down um, and then she came knocking on the door and said well we're gonna have a shift change now and the new midwife's coming she had only been there like a little while but anyway this new midwife came and um, she came and said hi and she said, I'm just going back to the car to get the things out and during that time she was at the car, I had a huge massive contraction and then something came out and I felt down and it, it was like a water bag. And then, and I called around the corner, midwife, midwife, are you there? And she, she wasn't there. And I thought, oh gosh, I'm going to have to <laughs> give birth without her here. And then she arrived back in and I said, something's come out. And then she said, I'll get towels. She got the towels, came back in. And then, and then a contraction just seemed to take over my whole body. And then I sort of leaned back and the baby propelled out of my build, my body. And and it was a kind of shock, but it was, it was like just quick. I had no control over it. And then I later learned that, that was the fetal ejection reflex that happens when you're pretty and uninhibited. I think all of the, you know, the concoction hormones in your body and the endorphins and the oxytocin are all working together. And just to create this you know, gorgeous amount of hormone to make it so that the baby's just going to be born really smooth. so that was wonderful and that was my son born and uh it, it was just a great experience and then afterwards we ate honey cake and we ate chocolate and we had tea and the, it didn't seem to you know impress on me any of it any of the, any of the fact sorry that she had to like write all of these notes up. just really quiet and lovely um the sacredness of birth was not impeded on at all it was excellent um so i thought okay well, well if i fall pregnant again i'll do that with my fifth baby well it didn't kind of go like that it was it was a lot different because uh i think so i missed a night's sleep because i was anticipating the baby coming like after the 
particular was having a whole day of contractions. I thought it must be tonight, but it didn't happen. So the whole of the next day, I kind of waited. Anyway, the midwives came. There was one midwife and a student midwife as well. And I, I just didn't click with them. I clicked with the younger one, but the older one I didn't seem to click with. I'm not sure why, but that just sometimes happens, you know, with like people in life, you don't always click with everybody. So I just tried to get into my zone and I lit my candle in my bathroom, which is where I was when I gave birth to my son. And I just tried to get into my zone. But then every 15 minutes, the, the midwife wanted to come in and check on me. And you see, like, because I'd had a cesarean, like the prior, not like a couple of years, a few years before, that, you know, they want to check me every 15 minutes. And I was just quite agreeable to that. I was like, yeah, of course, you, I'm really happy for you to do what you have to do. You do what you have to do and that's fine. But then in hindsight, I realized that perhaps this small, like invasion of my privacy did set me back quite a lot during this labor because I was already quite tired and, you know, so I kind of used up all my resources. Um, and then when it came for the baby to be born, you know, it took quite a long time. And then when she, the, the, when I was having the contractions, her head had come out and the midwife had to do this special maneuver to help her to be born. Um, and then her breathing was really fast and she seemed a bit shocked. And, you know, I was feeling quite shocked. And then, you know, we went up to bed and then the midwife said, <clears throat> well, after she said, well, after, you know, well, we, we may have to go to the hospital. Um, so she said, we'll just see how it goes. So I just had skin to skin with the baby because I know that helps to regulate the baby's breathing. And she just, she was absolutely wonderful. She was such a professional midwife um, because I hadn't really had it before where the midwife just checks all of you and to make sure that you don't have any tears or anything. Um, so I remember with my first, my first baby, I'd had a tear and the midwife hadn't noticed it. She didn't check afterwards. So she, this midwife did check. Um, and then she waited like throughout the whole of the night and just kept coming in every hour or half an hour to check on the baby's breathing. And then, you know, from midnight till five in the morning, the baby's breathing regulated. Um, and so we just could stay at home. But I just remember feeling after the birth, just so like awful. And they often say the midwives, oh, you may well feel like you've been hit by a train. Well, actually, I really did. I really felt it. I felt like I used up all of my physical and mental resources and I thought my gosh I've really done myself in I've had too many babies and this is what this is what I've got now <laughs> and I thought well that's it for me but then as I processed this by talking to friends and you know close friends um, I realized that actually you know I'd missed all of the sleep and you know different things you know, having lots of different midwives, like shift changes, all of that impacts on the woman. So, and I did fall pregnant two years after that. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to go through that. And, and I, I kind of, I kind of had to process it, you know. Um, but because by this point, my knowledge had increased as I'd moved like through the pregnancies and births and then back into motherhood and then into pregnancy again. Um, I took things on board, which you know, I'd experienced that had helped me and then discarded the other things that hadn't. Um, so I just kind of felt like, well, maybe I should just be responsible for my own pregnancy, um, seeing as I found it quite stressful going to these midwife appointments. So that's what I did. I just, I decided, well, I'll just seek out a midwife when I feel like she's going to give me more than she'll, she's going to take away. Um, so I, I spoke to different organizations like AIMS, it's the Associate, Association for Improvements in Maternity Care. And I spoke to birth rights to find out what my rights were doing this sort of thing. Um, I talked to other mothers who had been in a similar situation. So I did, I did not have any appointments with the midwife, but I did go and pay to have a private scan to find out where the placenta was um, because I'd had this previous cesarean and I wanted to make sure it was away of, you know, from the top of the cervix. Um, so then, you know, the pregnancy was pretty straightforward and, and just really lovely, actually, and, and no stress at all. It was just, you know, I had a lot of other stresses going on in my life, but my pregnancy, it was just absolutely wonderful and, and, and much nicer than any of the other pregnancies. Um, but then this was my own personal sort of decision after giving birth to five children already. It wasn't something I just took lightly. Um, so I kind of woke up noticing that I've been having contractions all night and then 
in the morning I, I kind of just got up and got on with the day um, we we're in the process of moving house so everything was getting packed away and I was just like relaxing and getting on with you know just concentrating on my own self for a while which was lovely um, and so then by the time the sun went down my contraction started getting stronger um, I had a, a doula friend there with me and she helped build me this pillow of cushions that I could just lean into and then everything was just you know getting stronger and I was just like having to really like work with with the contractions and just, you know go with them and my mind was like you know you know feeling strong and like talking to my you know talking to me like sort of like you know this is fine you know this is how it's been before you know all of this stuff then I got to the transition I thought this is where every woman gets and I never used to like to call it transition but where you know the contract sort of change to be all around your womb to more like your changes to be like more oh and like guttural and then it's kind of a more pushy feeling and you can kind of feel it within yourself if you kind of listen into your body um so at the point, i was like oh okay i think i'm going to call the midwife now um so i rang the midwife you know the local hospital and they were like they hadn't heard of me they were they were like okay we'll send someone so in an actual fact you know i got into my zone again and i felt quite confident again and you know the mid the, the contractions had changed and then within like a short amount of time um you know i gave birth to my baby and then you know about 45 minutes afterwards the midwife arrived in time for the placenta so i was pleased with that because the placenta always kind of uh made me feel pretty anxious i, I don't know why but um i didn't feel so confident with that part of birth but she was she was lovely she she came in and she gave a biology lesson to my eldest daughter showing her about the veins in the umbilical cord and but something I sensed something had changed like in the atmosphere it was like the sacredness of birth had like turned into something else um however you know it was it was good that she was there and um I just I just changed that I noticed that it had changed into this thing where she was having to like fill in all this paperwork and and you know check everything off like that but you know it was it was this birth it was just wonderful you know it, it was such a good experience to have sort of everything had culminated in this experience for me because I, I really felt then that perhaps this would be my last baby and to have had all of these experiences and then to come to this final sort of pinnacle moment of like you know taking responsibility for everything about the pregnancy and most of the birth um was a really empowering thing to experience um and I, I feel just so wonderful about it and just sharing these stories just makes me feel very very happy um so to surmise i think you know pregnancy and birth should be really received as an opportunity to spell any fears that you have you know and just to you know if you want to get informed about what's happening then do you know you don't have to take it all on board just take the things that you think might help you you know birth doesn't necessarily have to be seen as an illness um you know and, and what i've noticed is that relaxation if you don't do anything else relaxation is the key um so yeah learn about what happens to the body if you want to learn about what happens during pregnancy and childbirth and you know the corollary of that is like after the birth you know look you have your beautiful baby and it's, it's just a wonderful thing to like keep this in mind that you are going to be meeting your baby your baby is going through all of this as well um and and if you, if you can just be confident in your choices and, and communicate with your midwife you know tell her tell her your fears you know ask her questions um if it doesn't seem like she's got time just write it all down so that you know you're getting it out there and you know talk to other women who have had similar experiences because you know it it, it is going to help you to get the birth that you want and then afterwards it's going to be much better for you so to conclude you know i, I just wish that any if there is any pregnant women listening to this or any women looking to become pregnant in the future i just implore you to trust your instincts um, as you, you know, partake in this absolutely wonderful journey that epitomizes the sacredness of birth and pregnancy. Um, this beautiful baby here looking at his mother, you know, 
he's not really interested in getting his weight checked or being measured. He's looking at her face. You know, he's memorizing every characteristic that makes up his mother's face, you know, um, falling in love with her for the first time. And, you know, over time, he's going to be able to identify her face amongst a sea of people. So why not come to this moment alert, awake and excited to meet your baby? Thank you so much for listening. May God bless you all. Thank you very much, Abigail, for that wonderful presentation and for sharing your positive stories and your experiences with midwives. So there are a few questions that people are asking. And the first question is from Caroline. She said, I missed out on that bit of the injection on your thigh affecting the love hormone. Please, can you clarify? Yes. So what I recognized is that as soon as I was given the injection or, you know, a few minutes after, I was oblivious to the baby and I kind of just wanted to go up and wash off the blood and meconium off me where, you know, and then I noticed in other births where I hadn't had that. And it, and it was all about just wanting to be with the baby. So I just thought, well, why was that? And then I just realized that perhaps having this synthetic hormone that's like trying to replicate this love hormone or I'm imagining that I think that that's what it is doing um, it kind of blocks the love hormone because you know, you're having it put into you so it's kind of blocking what's going on you know it's interfering with what's going on in your body um, and so I, I just didn't want that because this, this amazing concoction of you know hormones that I talked about is, is going all around in your body preparing you and then your baby for this point where you're actually finally meet and um yeah to block that with something else i mean unless it's medically necessary yeah i would say to yeah find very out very good it. there's another question from linda linda asks what messages do you have for midwives I, I feel so grateful for midwives because I feel like without midwives, you know, it would be a pretty awful place uh, for women giving birth because especially now, I mean, I talk about trusting, trusting your instincts, but it's, it's hard. It's challenging in this, this world for women to trust their instincts with all of these other things going on, like media and TV and, you know, but for me, having seen my own mother like well, learning about her experience with me i kind of felt like i really wanted to go and do things completely differently um but in answer to the question sorry i'm digressing is that you know it should just be woman-centered and as much as possible i hope that w that midwives can carry on you know following their calling and 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 making it woman-centered even in the face of adversity when they're having to do all of this paperwork. I hope that they can just still find the courage to do what it is that they wanted to do from the beginning. Yeah. All right. Okay. Then let me take the last question or comment. Professor Goma is asking, why don't you try to apply your experience with another group of women? Yes, that's that's right. I, I, I do hold <coughs> pregnancy support groups. But I, I would like to kind of reach out a lot more and do different things, perhaps with the university students as well. And to, you know, so I, I was going to say, if any of you want to contact me, these are my details here. So if you, you know, have any further questions, um, please, I'm always happy to answer anything, you know, about pregnancy and birth. Thank All you. right. And just to read uh, some comments that people wrote, Margaret wrote, forward leaning, Linda wrote masterly in activity. Another person wrote, it's important to listen to your baby. Professor Goma acknowledged and thanked you for sharing your experiences. Abigail, this has been truly awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much for that. And for those who have further questions, please contact Abigail. Her contact is right there on this last slide. <laughs>